Um, so I thank you for coming to hear, to hear me talk about trauma and PTSD. I love this topic. It's what I do my work on and what I study. Um, but it is a bit of, it can be a bit of a downer, so I will try to not, you know, just focus on the negative. Um, I was thinking that um, when I'm on a plane or at a cocktail party and, you know, people ask you, you have that, that conversation and people ask you what you do, if I say, oh, I'm a scientist, and people say, what do you study? And I say, you know, PTSD, and they say, what is that? And I say, I say, I study, oh, I study, for example, women who've been raped. I often feel like I've just told them I have a highly contagious disease because they often they'll start looking uncomfortable and then backing away from me, looking for someone to talk to who's not gonna sort of talk about such topics. So anyway, thank you. I actually love talking to like general audiences about PTSD. And I'm gonna start this lecture by talking about myself and my own story um, because it's really linked to my work on PTSD. And then I'll talk to you about through of what we, some of what we know, what I've learned about PTSD, about who gets it and what helps. And then I'll loop back again to my own story. So to start with me and also as people are getting settled, um, when I was very young, even before high school, I always wanted to do work in Africa. I really had no idea how this came about. I don't know how many of you in the audience have kids and they come up with these crazy ideas, but I got really obsessed with this idea of working in Africa. No one in my family had ever been to Africa. I never knew anyone who'd been to Africa, so I can't say where this came from. Um, but it got stuck in my head to the point where I convinced my mom, who'd never been out of the US, to take me and my two siblings to Kenya for the summer. And um, when I was there, I fell in love with it. So I went forward and I decided that I was gonna do economic <coughs> development work in Africa. And I went to Wellesley College and I majored in economics and I studied African history. And I interned, I was very goal-directed, like I don't know if any of you know any Wellesley women, but we're very you know, focused and goal-directed. I had a plan, I majored in economics, I was like, I interned at the US Agency for International Development. After graduating, I worked at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, and I did debt, debt reallocation for developing countries, and then I got into the Peace Corps. And I went to Niger in West Africa, and all was going to plan. Um, and I settled in, I went to Niger and I settled into my village um, where I lived in a hut with no electricity and no running water. I learned Hausa and I worked with women who were starting small businesses. So then during Christmas, my family came to visit and my sister came and um, my mom, my sister came to my village. After my mom left, my sister and I traveled in the Sahara. We went up to Agadez, which is a city in the Sahara, um, north of Niger. And we went to stay at a home of a friend who was visiting family for the holidays. So in the morning of December 27th, two men we had met who were traders in the market um, came by to sell us some jewelry. My sister left with one of the men to, buy, to go buy jewelry from him in the market and I stayed back. And shortly after she left, the other man raped me. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of that here, but looking back, I see that my sister and I escaped with our lives. And two days later, my dream was shattered. The Peace Corps sent me home. I was on my way to DC. My sister went home to New Jersey. So after that, I became very anxious and I couldn't sleep. When I did, I had nightmares and I couldn't stop playing what happened to me over and over in my head. I felt like I was constantly in danger and on guard. Um, and to compound it, the rape itself was terrifying and humiliating, but the treatment I received at the time from the Peace Corps was worse. Um, I'll just give one ex brief example of that. Um, for example, I was sent to talk with a staff member. So Peace Corps volunteers, when they're medically evacuated, were sent to DC, and I was sent to talk to a staff member in the Inspector General's office. I don't know if people know what the Inspector General's office is, but the Inspector General's office polices the government. It's supposed to sort of follow up on things in the government. And I was told the Inspector General's office was um, trying to help female volunteers because they'd heard there'd been a lot of violence against female volunteers and that she wanted to talk to me so that she could um, you know, make things better for us. So I went to her office and she asked, you, why are you here? And I said, oh, well, I'd been raped in Niger um, and I'd been sent to talk to her. And I can still clearly remember her looking at me and saying, I'm so tired of talking to you girls. You go overseas, you're drinking and dancing and flirting with men, you lead them on, and then when they come on to you, you say you were raped. I was completely speechless. I remember I was only 23 years old. I was shocked, I walked, like I left, I left her office, I had been raped, the Peace Corps, which was my dream, had decided it was my fault. 
So I resigned and went home to my parents' home in New Jersey. After that, I moved above my parents' garage and I um, felt like a complete failure. I felt like my life was over. It's hard to imagine now, because I, I just turned 50, but at 23, I really thought my life was over. Um, I, all my friends at that time were in law school or medical school or in the city doing finance or you know, going to graduate school, and no one even knew I was home. So what did I do at that time? I became more and more depressed. I laid in bed unable to sleep. I was thinking of ways to kill myself. When I did sleep, I had nightmares, and I lost interest in everything. I couldn't focus, I couldn't read a book, I couldn't watch TV or watch a movie. I was irritable with my family. And basically what I did all day was walk around my town. Um, and the town I grew up in was a small town in New Jersey. The only other person who walked around as much, walked the town as much as I did, was someone we grew up calling Crazy Tom, who looking back probably had schizophrenia. And I walked so much, my mom was worried I was going crazy like him. And in my mind, I was already crazy like him. I'd already lost it. So I actually don't remember really how I survived, except that I was lucky. I had a family to go home to. I had a home. I had food, food, and, um, food and food to eat. And my parents had no idea what to do, but they knew enough to let me be and not push me so hard. Um, so this is, I actually forgot to do this. This is me in the Peace Corps in my village. Um, then one night after being home for a bit, my mother's friend Susan called me and asked me to come over. And this was a really critical turning point for me. Now Susan was someone I had known since childhood. She was a friend, my mom's friend. Um, my dad had worked with her husband. But I didn't really have any independent relationship with her. So I was surprised when she called me and asked me to come over. But she did, and I went. And uh, I really had, at the time, I had nothing else to do. So, and I, would rem I remember sitting in her living room, and it was, it was night, and it started getting darker. And we sat there in the dark, and she told me that she had been raped when she was in high school. She had gone out of her mind. She couldn't eat or sleep, and she was having nightmares. And then she found out she had gotten pregnant. She tried to kill herself by driving her car into a tree. She survived, but she lost the baby. And then she went on to tell me how she, I was the first person she had ever told besides her husband, and how the, she had let the rape influence her life influence her choices, influence her career, and limit her in ways, and she didn't want that to happen to me. So she looked at me and begged me to get help, to get off the trajectory I was on, which was quickly going down the tubes. And she did more than that. She actually found a therapist for me. She had already called the therapist and made an appointment and told me I needed to go. So I had never been in any kind of therapy before, and I was very skeptical. The idea of talking to a stranger was terrifying. Actually, as an aside, so I have an 11-year-old son, and he's grown up in Cambridge, New York City, and Brookline. Um, so there's a very different cultural norm in the places he's grown up about therapy than where I grew up in New Jersey. <laughs> he actually, I picked him up from the bus this spring one day, and he said to me, he got off the bus um, in, in, uh, where I picked him up in Newton, and he says, Mommy, I've decided I want a psychologist. And I, I was like, this, he's 10, you know. And I said, well, okay, why do you want a psychologist? He said, well, my friends, Brooks and Anders, talk to a psychologist, and they find it very helpful. <laughs> it's like, so that's like a totally different, that was not the culture I grew up in, right? So, um, plus I had thought I, was thought, I was worried if I told her my story, what if she blamed me? What if she said it was my fault? But honestly, at that point, I was desperate. I had no idea what else to do, so I went. And for me, going to therapy was a huge turning point. At our first session, I told her what had happened to me, that I'd been raped in Africa. And I just, I told her how I was jumpy on guard and I was angry all the time at everyone, and that I had nightmares on insomnia, and that I felt like I was stuck in this dark tunnel, moving more and more quickly, but it only got darker and there was no light at the end. So the therapist explained to me that I had something called post-traumatic stress disorder. She said that PTSD was something that many people experience after going through a trauma not just soldiers who've been in war, which is sort of how I had it from seeing when I was in college, I saw Platoon, movies like that. And she said the only way to really get better was to talk about it and to talk about what happened. So I did, slowly, and I started feeling better. And after I started feeling better, we started thinking about my future, and I started feeling again like I had a future. Um, so I took my first psychology class, and I started reading about PTSD. I volunteered at a rape crisis center, and I decided I wanted to be a clinician and have, help other women who'd gone through similar experiences. So I got my PhD in clinical psychology, went to graduate school, but in graduate school I fell in love with research and decided to focus my career on trauma and PTSD. And so the questions that I talk about tonight are really the questions that were motivated by my experience, 
um, are really the questions on which I've focused my career. Um, and I'm purposely going to try to keep this um, it's broad and brief um, in the sense that I'd hope to answer, I'd really like to answer people's questions here rather than hear myself talk. So, um, so what do we know about trauma and PTSD? First of all, we know that trauma exposure as either victim or witness is common. I was under the misconception, and some people still are, that it's really something only soldiers experience, but it's something that really many people experience. And I think this is more well known now because in the media almost every week or every other day are uh, mass traumatic events. Um, for people who can't see, I just have images up here. I mean, if you think of um, Las Vegas, Florida, uh, terrorist attacks around the world, huge natural disasters, we're always hearing about these events. And I do studies which are called epidemiologic studies, where we study large populations of people um, and ask them about their experience. So an epidemiologic study is where we define a population, let's say Cambridge, and then we randomly choose people in order to ask about their experiences, and we try to make statements about things that, of the whole population. Um, and so what, when we've looked around the world, these are the countries in color are ones we've studied, um, we find that most people in the country studied have experienced at least one event. These events are not rare. And that if we just look in the US, over half of Americans have been exposed to trauma more than once. It's incredibly common. Now, I talked about my own PTSD, so some people develop post-traumatic stress disorder after witnessing or experiencing trauma. Um, and so what is PTSD? I mean, I, I described my experience of it, but a lot of us consider it a disorder of fear. And I really like Judy, Judy Herman's um, description, which is after traumatic experience, the human system of self-preservation goes on permanent alert, as if the danger might occur at any moment, return at any moment. And we know that fear is evolutionarily useful. If any of you have children, you'll know that if you have ever, have ever had a toddler, you know that one of the problems is they have no, many toddlers have no fear. They'll put their hand in the fire, they'll climb up, you know, there's, this is like not a very toddler friendly place. They would like, you know, throw themselves off the side of the walls, etc. And we need to learn fear in order to, you know, stay alive, essentially. But in PTSD, the fear is just regulated. And basically, the fear persists even though the threat has gone away. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. We also know that PTSD is common globally. So we just look at how many people have PTSD. On average, if we look at adults from age 18 to 55, which are the kind of group people study, we know that 1% um, globally have PTSD in a one-year period, or in lifetime, it's about 5.6%. Now, the thing is that many people have PTSD symptoms after a trauma, but many, but the majority recover without treatment. Um, so I'm going to try this whole pointer thing. Yeah, so I'm told if I do the pointer here, you can see it there. Cool. Okay, so um, this is a study done in Israel, and it was thousands of people who were, um, who, were, who were recruited from emergency rooms after experiencing a traumatic event. And the events that they experienced were things like accidents and terrorist attacks and other kinds of violence. And what you can see here basically is that right after, the, you know, in the short time after the event, everyone has a lot of symptoms, right? So just how you're responding immediately doesn't really tell us much about how you'll respond long term. But if you look over time, what's striking is, um, sorry, what's striking is that a lot of people, um, the majority of people actually remit on their own pretty rapidly. And then there's another sm a smaller group which also remit on their own more slowly. And this is not a treatment study. This is a natural study of following people's responses afterwards. And then there's this group of people who are the people we would say have chronic PTSD who don't remit. So really it's this non-remission that defines PTSD. As you can see in my own experience, my symptoms persisted in the absence of treatment. I was someone whose symptoms persisted over time. We also see this, for example, we look at a single trauma like rape. So this was a study, this was actually a waitlist control for a treatment study. So this was a study where they recruited women from emergency room and randomly one went into treatment, one was in the control group. And what they found was that after the rape, pretty much everyone had these really high symptoms. But 12 weeks later, they looked at the waitlist control and they found that 50, only 50% 50 of the women still had clinically significant symptoms. And these women had not received any treatment. So for many people, um, there was this natural course of recovery. Now, um, 
So who gets PTSD? So I'm going to talk about basically three clumps of factors. Um, one is that um, who gets PTSD is related to the type and severity of trauma exposure. So PTSD risk is highest for interpersonal violence events. Those are events like rape, childhood abuse. We also include combat in that, attacks, muggings, et cetera. Um, and you can also get PTSD, I was just talking to someone after, before, from accidents, um, from witnessing terrible things that happen to other people, and from disasters. But if you look at, these are, um, this is sort of a summary of a lot of different data. If you look at the green, the green line and the, um, the gold line, you can see that the prevalence of PTSD after a rape is much higher than the prevalence of PTSD after an accident. And one of the reasons we think this is the case is because human beings, we need food, clothing, and shelter, right? But also, our interactions, our social uh, relationships with other human beings are part of, are something we need to survive. We can't exist in isolation. So when someone commits violence against another human being, it's a real break of social bonds that is feels that, that's felt in a different way than what people might call like an act of God or an accident or something that was out of human control. But under extreme conditions, nearly everyone is vulnerable to PTSD. So I just want to make sure people, you know, so we talk about risk and resilience. But I've seen some data, for example, a study in Rwanda where 100% of people in the genocide had had PTSD who survived the genocide. This is um, some um, older data from um, prisoners of war. And what you can see is these are men who were prisoners of war, World War II. And um, you can see that in their, um, they're clustered by the, type, the camps they were in. So these were um, men who were in the Japanese camps, Korean camps, or European camps um, for, different, for different conflicts. And what is known is that the Japanese camps, or prisoners of war, were really the worst conditions. Um, and you can see under those really horrific conditions, almost all the men, uh, sorry, I'm having trouble with this, all, almost all the men had PTSD. Um, and so if the conditions are bad enough, you know, everyone at some point may get PTSD. The other things that influence who gets PTSD are gender, race, ethnicity, and other social factors. So um, women are more likely to get PTSD than men, um, even if we look after the same trauma. Um, so if men and women are both in a similar car accident, women are at higher risk of PTSD. In the US, um, certain ethnic minority groups are at higher PTSD. Um, specifically um, African-American men. And, um, and so, you know, so those social factors do influence who gets PTSD. One of the main reasons we think this is the case is because of the different kinds of traumas people experience. So I'll give one specific example of this. We did a study, this is quite a long time ago now, but we looked at um, lifetime PTSD by sexual orientation. And we found that gay men and lesbian women were significantly more likely to have PTSD than heterosexual men and heterosexual women. And um, when we looked at why this was the case, we found that it was because there were differences in trauma exposure. So if you um, look at this, um, you can see that, it's, it's hard to see from some of you here, but this is the, you can see that the amount of um, interpersonal violence that gay and lesbian, gay men and lesbian women or bisexual women experience is way much higher than heterosexuals. And so these differences in PTSD and mental health that we were seeing in gays and lesbians and heterosexuals was really due to differences in exposure to violence, and particularly in this case, violence that occurred before the age of 12, so childhood violence. Um, and the other thing people have been interested in terms of social context is how what's going on in the wider society influences PTSD. So for example, we know that whether soldiers have PTSD and it persists, so, there, so social context doesn't cause PTSD. Um, you know, seeing something on TV doesn't cause PTSD. But for soldiers, if they have PTSD and they come back, for example, to a social context that blames them or stigmatizes them, where they can't get jobs, et cetera, they can't reintegrate, they're more likely to have persistent PTSD. The same thing, other things like experiences, people have done more work recently, experiences of racism, or for sexual assault survivors, the constant media coverage of sexual assault, while positive in many ways, can also be triggering and have um, sort of help the, make the um, PTSD symptoms more persistent. The area a lot of that I've done a lot of work on, which um, I'm happy to, I'm going to do something brief on it now, but I'm happy to answer more questions about this, is um, how pre-trauma factors influence who gets to PTSD. So how the things you bring to the experience of trauma influence whether you get PTSD. 
Um, and a lot of this work, um, so a lot of the, this work that, I, that I've done, um, there's a long history of this work that's mainly focused on soldiers from World War I and World War II. And a lot of the foundational work I want to give credit for was done by actually the person who ends up, who I found out may, much later in my career, was my academic great-grandfather, um, um, Elliot Slater, who was a psychiatrist in England, and he studied thousands and thousands of World War I and World War II soldiers, and he wrote this paper called The Neuroses of War. Um, he didn't have a name PTSD for what they experienced. But what he says here, which he wrote in 1944, is basically what we found, you know, studying this more and more, you know, many, many, many years later. And, that's he, and he writes it really well. He says, the evidence was that the terrifying stressors of war tended to provoke anxiety states, which he, which he called PTSD, to a significantly preferential extent. That is, war does produce this anxiety um, more than other kinds of experiences, but they did so far from regularly. A more important type of determinant of response was the constitution of the individual as shown in his family history, previous life, and personality. And see, he really pioneered the, looking at these other factors on how, how they influence soldiers' responses to war. And one of the things we really focused on at, at our work at the Broad Institute is looking at geneti how genetic factors influence risk of PTSD. So one thing we've learned over the past about 20 years is that PTSD is heritable. That means our genes influence our risk of PTSD. And its heritability or its genetic component is similar to that of other psychiatric disorders that may, you may more commonly be understood to be genetic. So for example, like schizophrenia, people know that um, schizophrenia runs in families, autism, uh, autism spectrum disorder. Um, and um, Crohn's disease here, this is ADHD. People might be familiar with their type 2 diabetes. So the PTSD, the, the amount that genes influence PTSD in women and men seems to vary, but it's in the range of other things we think of as influenced by genetics. And the reason we study genetics is because um, it's really hard in neuropsychiatric disorders to really get at what's going wrong biologically. And why is that? That's because we can't, we can't cut off pieces of the human brain and study it. If I am a cardiologist and I do cardiology research, I can actually get at the heart. I can study the heart, I can biopsy the heart um, in live humans. But in psychiatric disorders, we're relying on post-mortem tissue to you know, people to, who donate it to look at the brain. We can also do imaging, but that's a step removed from actually looking at the live human brain. So we look at genetics at the Broad in order to really start to dig into the biology and, and, and improve clinical care. So we see the genetics as really foundational. So from looking at genes, how genes influence PTSD, and this work is really underway. Right now, we don't have genes. I can say these genes influence risk of PTSD. We're in the middle of doing a study of about 100,000 people. We're looking at people with PTSD and without and looking at whether there's um, variation in genes that influence risk of PTSD. And the goal of this work is to really help us understand the pathophysiology um, and then to um, uh, to lead to better therapeutics and diagnostics. So then to finish, I'll talk about what helps. What do we know about what helps? So if you think about, the way I like to think about it in order to think about what helps is look at the whole, um, the time course of PTSD and look at where we have opportunities for prevention and treatment. So if, um, um, if we look at the time course of PTSD here, then we have, you know, there, there are many different places where we could intervene. We could intervene by preventing the traumatic experience. We could intervene in the sort of what we call the acute aftermath, which is like zero to one month period. Um, we do have treatments that, if given in that time, reduce people's risk of developing PTSD. Um, then we can do what we call secondary prevention, which is re really treating PTSD once it develops by psychotherapy or medication, and then tertiary prevention, which I won't um, really talk about tonight, but that is um, a lot of, another area of my work focuses on how PTSD influences physical health over the life course. We know people with PTSD are at increased risk of diabetes, um, heart, heart disease and stroke, and um, some evidence of cognitive decline. And so um, there's, for example, there's arguments that soldiers who come back from war who have PTSD might be screened, for example, for these other health complications. Um, a lot of efforts right now that I'm focused on are, um, and us at the Broad are focused on, do, um, sorry, doing that, 
looking at early markers of risk and resilience. So um, the reason we're doing work on this is because a certain proportion of trauma survivors um, do come into contact with the healthcare system in the month or so after a trauma. So for example, in huge natural disasters, people interact with FEMA, for example. Um, or um, there are thousands and thousands of people who end up in the emergency room each year after car accidents or assaults, et cetera. And the problem we have right now is that, as I showed those earlier slides, is that all those, many, many of those people will be symptomatic. Many of those people will be having you know, nightmares and insomnia and feel anxious after what they've experienced. It's totally normal. So if you have thousands and thousands of people who've experienced a really big traumatic event, let's say like Hurricane Katrina or the 9-11 terrorist attacks or the recent um, hurricane in Puerto Rico, how do you decide who's at risk of developing PTSD so you can target prevention? Because the best, the best prevention efforts for developing PTSD are pretty resource intensive. They involve one-on-one -on -one cognitive behavioral therapy, basically trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. And if you have tens, if you have thousands and thousands of people, you're not going to be able to get in each person an individual therapist. So we really want to try to understand, beyond symptoms, how do we identify who's at risk and who's not? Because a whole chunk of people, probably like 50 to 75 percent of people, are going to recover on their own. And so we actually have a huge study going on, again, this right now, so we don't have the results from it, um, where we're recruiting people from 16 emergency rooms around the country to following them very closely over time to try to understand this, looking at everything from their genes, other biological markers, their social support, their health behaviors, you know, smoking, drinking, et cetera, um, their social networks, things like that, to try to understand so that we can get much better at predicting who's at risk and who's not. And this is like a classic high-risk strategy. So for example, if we develop, we have a, right now we have what's called a polygenic score for PTSD. And that's a basically a fancy name for, we look at across the whole genome and we add up, um, we add up um, the, 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 we add up the things, the, the, the variants that are associated with PTSD, we sort of add up their effect. This is an oversimplification, but just say, if we were able, ever able to get a score that was good enough where we could predict who would get PTSD. We don't have that score at this point, but um, at, at some point, if we had a polygenic score or another biomarker or a risk profile that was able to predict who would get PTSD, we would want to you know, identify those who are at high risk and then decrease their risk, do an intervention to reduce their risk. And like I said, we have many effective treatments for PTSD we might want to deliver. Um, the most effective treatments for PTSD, I'll just talk briefly, are trauma-informed cognitive behavioral therapies, or there's a range of them. But most of the treatments that are, have been shown to be effective have some component of focusing on the trauma. It may be thinking about the trauma, it may be imagining it, and some of it's writing about it, it might be talking about it, it's not necessarily talking about it in all of them. But there's some component of focusing on the trauma, and those are the most effective treatments for PTSD. In terms of medication, there are the SSRIs, like, for example, Paxil have been used for PTSD. But really, um, the first line is either joint medication and psychotherapy or psychotherapy, because really it's been the cognitive behavioral therapies that have been most effective for PTSD. But what we know is that most persons with PTSD don't receive any mental health treatment. So these are data from over across the globe from the same sample I showed you in the beginning with the map. And what it shows is that in, even in high income countries, only about 30% of people with PTSD get specialty mental health treatment. And if you look at low income countries, it's abysmal, it's less than 5%. So we know that most people aren't receiving specialty mental health treatment. And even within that, we don't know that they're receiving effective or the best mental health treatment. Um, and so we also need to think about prevention and not just treatment. And I'm in a school of public health, so we talk about prevention a lot. And prevention is the act or practice of stopping something bad from happening, the act of preventing something. And I think in terms of when we think about trauma and PTSD, we don't just want to focus on, uh, we need to help people who have PTSD, but we also want to think of alternative population health strategies. Um, which would be shifting this risk distribution, which basically would involve addressing trauma exposure. So I mentioned in the beginning that one of the ways we can think about preventing PTSD is really including the prevention of trauma exposure. <clears throat> 
So when I say that, um, when I think of it, when I move from treatment to prevention, one of the first questions I get is prevent trauma, which, how, there are so many different traumas, we can't prevent disasters, et cetera. So how would we think about that? And I think we do have a lot of information which can help us think about this. So epidemiology, which are these population-based studies I do, really point us to which traumatic events may be most important for PTSD prevention at the population level. And we do these studies, I said we do these population-based studies where we randomly select people from a population and we ask them about trauma, PTSD, depression, all kinds of different questions, and people actually do answer the questions, you'll be surprised. And um, what we found, what we do is when we add up all the PTSD months in a population, so we assess, we, we study a population, and then, for example, if I had PTSD for two years, I would add 24 months. If you had PTSD for three months, you'd add three months, and we look at all the PTSD months in the population, and then we say, what traumas are responsible for how much of the months in the population? So we can actually link which traumas are responsible for the most PTSD. And what we find is that in the U.S., physical and sexual violence account for over half the PTSD burden in the U.S. population. And in this, in this um, sort of pie chart, physical and sexual violence does not include combat and war. So counter to really a lot of perception, it's really, there, PTSD is a huge problem among U.S. soldiers. It's not to diminish that. But in the U.S. population, it's really sexual and physical violence that account for most of the PTSD. One of the questions I often get is this yellow thing, which is the other. So these are also events that could include physical sexual violence happening to someone else in your network. There are a lot of network events, like having, um, like an example would be, you know, having um, a sister who was mugged or having a daughter who was raped, and um, that's sort of included in those kinds of, in the other category. This is just to say that prevention of sexual and physical violence may really be our most effective way of reducing the population burden of PTSD in the US. And there's many different ways that um, people are working on, on, on this. So these are just some examples. So um, some of the strategies folks have used and have actually studied and shown to work, um, which aren't up here, are things like hotspot policing. So there's folks who map in cities and communities where violence occurs and sort of focus criminal justice efforts on those places to prevent violence. Um, a lot of these other things you guys will be, I think people will be familiar with. There's huge efforts now to prevent gun violence, for example, um, hashtag Me Too movement. Um, there's also legal efforts like Title IX. So the, um, the efforts that have been in universities around sexual violence have really been around implementing Title IX. And then there's these um, more, I guess, more novel efforts which use social media to track, for example, sexual harassment in cities. There was a big effort in Cairo um, where people were tracking um, um, harassment in Cairo and then using that to sort of advise people on what areas of the city to avoid and things. So there's, there's a lot of efforts. A lot of them are, are led by trauma survivors. Um, and you, again, if you think of hashtag me too or the, the um, national school walkout in March, et cetera, led by trauma survivors. Um, and really outside of academia, led by journalists and activists. And one of the challenges is that academics is that um, there's all these efforts and we really don't know a lot about what works. Um, so one of the things that people are working on are partnerships between sort of these activism and policy efforts and sort of being able to study, do they really reduce the things, do, are they effective in reducing what we want to address? So to conclude, I want to speak with my, talk a little bit more about my own experience related to this. So my own story um, brought me from research to activism also. So after I had mentioned um, that I went into research and P trauma and PTSD research, and after a, a few years, my rape was something I thought I put behind me. So I started my professional career, and although I was studying trauma and PTSD, I never talked about my own experience. My first job after my training was at the Boston VA Hospital in JP, and I worked in the um, women's clinic, and I treated women with military sexual trauma and never really thought connected with my own experience at all. I wasn't particularly hiding it, it just never came up. And if people ha asked how I got in the field, I usually tell some story about how I served in the Peace Corps in Niger and I saw a lot of adversity and I was interested in how people cope with adversity and people accepted that. 
Um, so everything was sort of going well for me. And then on January 9th in 2011, I was actually bathing my son when my phone started buzzing. And a friend told me, you have to turn on the TV. There's a show on 2020 where all these women in the Peace Corps have had the same experience you had. And I hadn't really thought about that experience. This is, again, this is like 20 years later. So there was a show on 2020, um, Brian Ross did a show, where he interviewed um, Peace Corps volunteers, women who'd recently been in the Peace Corps, been sexually assaulted, and then mistreated by the Peace Corps. And I found the show online that evening. I couldn't watch it at the time it was on. And I was just shocked, because these women's experience was so similar to my own experience, to the point where their stories, I was convinced they had, they had interacted with some of the same people I had interacted with, but some of them had, actually. Um, and so I was like, I really didn't know what to do. I heard all these, these were much younger women, again, about 20 years younger than me at the time. And um, I thought, well, I should help, I should do something. But another part of me didn't really want to get involved. I mean, this has been behind me. I, I like, it was my past. I was busy, I was a professor, I was a wife and a mom. Um, and I just was like, I remember being there really in turmoil. And um, when I was trying to decide what to do, so my, my, my dad was a big role model for me, and he was an intense guy. And as we were growing up from a very young childhood, he would always say this um, line from Luke in the New Testament to us, to me and my siblings, even at like the age of five, I can remember him saying that. He'd say, you need to, you, to him who much is given, much is expected. Um, and so I kind of heard his voice in my head. He, was, he had died several years before that. And I knew I had to do something. So I, luckily for the internet, I sort of searched the women and I kind of reached out. And then a friend of, um, a friend of the family actually had, had worked for Brian Ross. So she contacted him, put me in touch with them, and I was flown to New York to do an interview. So um, this is me. Then on May 9th, 2011, I testified in front of the, full house, the House Full Foreign Affairs Committee, which has about 45 members. And I don't know if people here, a lot of people here are probably familiar with what that means. But um, it meant that I read a statement, a very detailed statement re describing my rape and my treatment by the Peace Corps. Um, but what was really important for me is I was able to use everything I learned in my research to talk about what the Peace Corps could do better and how their practices should be changed. And then I answered questions on that. And all of that was made public and was put, avail put online. And in the same day, my interview with um, Brian Ross was released on Good Morning America. I wrote an op-ed in the Boston Globe. And then I was interviewed on CNN and Fox. And um, so I went from having this very private experience that went completely public in a very short time. And um, I hadn't, to be honest, I, before it happened, I hadn't really thought about it. I hadn't thought about the fact that also once this is out there, it's always out there. For, um, if you Google my name, which I have an unusual name because my father made up my first name, um, you find this is what comes up about me. It's there. Um, and so um, it's always going to be there. And um, I had this experience um, not that long ago where uh, my son was at a friend's house, and my son is now 11. He was 10 at the time. And they were Googling their parents' names. And that's, a, that's normal. And my friend saw that they started watching one of my interviews. Luckily, she kind of shut that down. Um, but it was one of those things that like you don't, again, I didn't really think about it you know, at the time. But, um, but in terms of how I felt at the time, um, I remember after my CNN interview, I got in a taxi. And I, thought, I, sat, I sat in the taxi and I thought, oh my god, I feel a million pounds lighter. Um, it really hit me that I didn't have to pretend anymore. And I also didn't have to make the decision of whether to tell people. It's all out there. Um, and really, everything was out there. When the detailed, in the interviews, I had to talk about being suicidal and having PTSD and everything. And I was actually okay. I talked about all of it, and I was okay. And so um, over the next year after that, I went to Washington regularly, weekly. I talked to senators and Congress people with, with, other, uh, with other women from the Peace Corps. And um, we helped, we worked, with, worked on legislation that helped um, change standards in terms of treatment of sexual assault victims in the Peace Corps. And what was really shocking um, was that, um, what's shocking in today's climate is so we testified in May and the bill was passed, it was signed by President Obama right before Thanksgiving. So that was in a very short period that actually this test, the testimony got turned into legislation. So we were really, I was lucky, the women who I testified with were really lucky. And we know, I know that most women and men who experience assault or experience trauma 
never get to tell their story. But I got to tell my story um, even though I was blamed. I didn't have to suffer in silence. I got to tell my story publicly and then have it influence something positive for other people. And that was really a victory that I couldn't have imagined when I was 23 and suicidal in my parents' garage um, and would never also have happened if I hadn't gotten help. So to just close this so I can answer your questions, in terms of trauma and PTSD, what helps? Treatment really helps. Treatment actually does work. So I want everyone here or people in this whole Facebook thing um, to know that treatment helps and there is effective treatment out there. And telling your story does help. And even though it's really hard, all the effective treatments for PTSD include some aspect of telling your story. Like I said, it could be imagining it. Sometimes it's not talking about it. It could be writing about it. But they include something like that. But I also think there's, there's a, we, the rest of us have a responsibility to provide a social context where women and men and boys and girls who have experienced all kinds of trauma can tell their stories and be heard. And if these stories can be turned into movements and create better policies, that's even better. But if we can just create context for them to tell their stories, that will help them. So I'm going to end there, and I want to answer your questions. So thank you so much for coming. Um, and briefly, I just want to um, acknowledge my, you can clap, but I want to acknowledge, I want to make sure I acknowledge all the students and postdocs and people who've worked with me on all the things the data presented, and also acknowledge my funders. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karisten. We will open the floor up for questions. If you're in the room, raise your hand, and I'll run up to you with the microphone. But just so you know, I didn't get my, stout, my step count yet today. I'm <laughs> counting on you people. And just a reminder to our Facebook Live audience, if you have a question, just post it as a comment, and I'll try to work it into the session as best I can. Thank you. I'm good. Can one develop uh, PTSD or, or some type of trauma being in a home environment where there's a lot of yelling and screaming and it's not, incident, it's not one time explosive but it may be uh, dur over a long period of time? Yes. And then the second thing is this eye movement. What, what is that? Is that a treatment oh, as well? Oh, eye movement, desensitization. Yeah. Process. Yes. But maybe talk more about the first. Yeah, so um, the first is, um, um, the, the short answer is, is yes. Um, there's been a lot of work done on, it is a different experience having, you know, having a, having a you know, okay life and having one really bad event is a different experience than having uh, like a longer period of childhood abuse or domestic violence, or which is in some ways more similar to the experience of maybe being a POW, um, where you have this chronic, um, kind of can't escape from it. Um, so there are similarities. I think there are other things, people in those experiences, um, for J Judy Herman's book, I highly recommend to people, Trauma and Recovery, I think there's a new edition out, but she really wrote about how the experience of being in a, a, a child in an abusive home, being a person who experiences domestic violence, being a prisoner of war, um, how those are all, the effects and the commonality of those experiences, which also really change maybe in a more dramatic way, how you see the world, how you experience other people, your personality. So there can be other things beyond other things people experience. So yes, um, yes, and then it's AMDR, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. And there is evidence that that is, that is effective. I can talk more about that, but yeah, that's. Karsten, we have a question up here, way in the back. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Can you bring up back the slide with the three lines? Of the which one? I'm sorry. Uh, one that uh, how it, it uh, diminishes with time. Oh, how it diminishes with time. Okay, yes. Hold on. Can you find? <laughs> I'm really a spaz with this computer, so I will have it. Yes, I will. So basically, my question is. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll go back. Sorry. It's okay. The one with the so the, the, top, the lines going down, right? So the top two lines are almost identical. Whereas the third one has a very different, can you talk about it a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, these are sort of averages over lots of people. Um, but yeah, so I think in what it shows is kind of similar to this second um, line and this one are kind of, is that 
in uh, the majority of people, there's this really, this pretty rapid decrease in, in symptoms. And um, um, so they'll have maybe for, maybe even for a month, they may have pretty serious like anxiety and feeling afraid and uh, problem sleeping, but it will pretty quickly go down after that. Um, and they'll really experience like the, they're getting better. Like, oh, I, you know, I, I feel better. Um, and then in this middle group, it just takes longer. Um, and um, that could be due to many different factors. So there may be things about the person that make it more person more vulnerable. Some of the things we know about that are um, if you've had prior trauma, that influences it. Like someone mentioned that. Um, if you have um, if you have a history of depression, um, there can be environmental factors that influence it. It also could be that. Um, you have um, less you know, social support or other stressors in your life. We know that if you have problems like stressors at home, um, we know after a disaster, for example, if people have lose their job and they can't, um, you know, they can't like, feed their families and they have other stressors, their PTSD is like, going to be slower to remit. So it could be those kinds of things. Um, and then there's the people. But eventually that goes down. And actually, I didn't show this in this slide, but in this article they talk about um, they did, in this big study, they nested an intervention study in it, and they looked at which group it helped, and the intervention was actually most effective in that middle line, in this line. So the intervention really helped these slow remitters look more like rapid remitters, but the intervention did not help the non-remitting group. I didn't talk about that part of the study. Um, so these are also people who seem to be uh, much more influenced by, you know, intervention. To be, the intervention can help them get better faster. Does that answer your question? Oh, oh sorry. Okay. That's okay. Oh, the going up in the beginning. Yeah, I wouldn't make a lot of, I mean, I wouldn't make a lot of that. Um, yeah, it's, 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 I mean, that could be, that's, um, yeah, I would, I, I, that's sort of an artifact of where, of the, like, average. I wouldn't, because if you look at the, like, the numbers it's between, it's like the number of the symptom severity, it's not a lot. So I wouldn't make a lot of that, yeah. Sorry. And Karsten, we do have a question from Facebook. Yes. Can you talk about treatment when there is amnesia or dissociation that can occur after trauma? Can I talk about, so with amnesia and dissociation after trauma? Is that yeah. right? Okay. Um, yes. So um, what the person who asked about the, um, the experience of a child, like chronic, of being a home that's sort of chronically um, kind of somewhat violent, um, in these, especially after traumas that are chronic, like those, uh, again, uh, domestic violence situations, et cetera. Um, people, one of the things people experience that's different than what I talked about is with dissociation. Um, and so dissociation can take different forms. From the most extreme form is what people talk about amnesia. So people can actually forget what happened. Um, and that can happen after an extreme event because it's, uh, in, people have theories about that. Um, the other thing people talk about is um, people, in terms of dissociation, people losing track of time, um, sort of forgetting things. Um, there's an extreme form, which is called psychogenic fugue, um, which is when people kind of almost like leave their lives and start, start a whole different, kind of live a separate life. They sort of live these divided lives. Um, and um, so, those are, so those, are, those are things that can happen after trauma. It's not a particular area that I have focused on, but we, ha we do see it in our studies, global studies. We do see these kinds of things cross-culturally. So it is something that happens across different cultures. And usually associated with more severe trauma, trauma happens earlier in life, and trauma that's really chronic. Oh, good question. Hi, um, I was really struck by the comment when you started telling your story. You said the rape was bad, but the treat how the Peace Corps treated me was worse. Yes, and it got me wondering. And this is my question: um, You talk a bit about interventions that can yeah. help. Right. I'm wondering if you can offer also some warnings of things that make it worse and things to look <laughs> out for. I could do that. I mean, so I think of like the shame element yes. of, as being a huge one when it comes to being able to recover from trauma. Yes. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that. That's good. Thank you for that question. Because I, yeah. So, um, yes. So, in terms of things 
right? So, James, things that make it worse, telling someone it's their fault, that will make it worse. Um, I think that, um, um, so I think that, uh, so I think the shame element is huge. And um, I think what's, um, and then I think the other piece is taking away the person's control. So trauma is experienced, um, it, it, you know, some of the obvious example would be rape, but with, you lose control of your body. But in any kind of thing that's experienced as traumatic is you lose control. And um, you think things, doing things that you think are supportive, but take away the person's control. So um, I'll give an, a kind of extreme example of this. So I mentioned this, this guy over here reminded me of this story. So a friend of mine in, in um, the September 11 terrorist attacks was in the World Trade Center Tower. And she got out. Um, and I talked to her afterwards, shortly after, and she was OK. I mean, shaken, and it was terrible, but OK. And then she called me about like a month later. And she said, Kirsten, I think I have PTSD. And I said, well, what, you seem so much, you seemed okay. I talked to you every week. You seemed, you know, what happened? And her company and all, like they wanted to be helpful, mandated that all their employees do group therapy on their experience of being in the World Trade Center Tower. She, she basically had to do forced mandated group ther trauma therapy. And the therapy gave her PTSD. She had nightmares about the other people's stories in the therapy. And the type of therapy that was done, people studied it later and actually found that it actually either had no effect or made people worse. Because, and the idea behind it was, so what, what went wrong with this? One is they mandated it. So they took away people's control. So one of the things we see here is that many people do just recover. And so, so as humans, we actually, some of us know something about how to recover from some events. Not everyone, I didn't, I, I needed help. But some people recover, and so um, you, you, there's a balance between being helpful to someone and forcing them to talk about something or um, you know, join a support group before they're ready. So I think that, that, I mean, so I think some of the, so you talked about the shame, but it's also this sort of balance of supporting a person but not taking away their control, not sort of forcing them to do anything before they're ready. And when I think about my own parents who really had no idea, now that I'm a parent, I'm like, it's, it's, they had no idea what to do. The one thing they did do is they kind of supported me, but they didn't push me too much. So even going to therapy, they never, it wasn't in their lexicon, so they didn't make me go. I went on my own. So it started giving me my sense of control. So does that answer some of your question? There's a question. Oh, another. You got a question down here? Hi. Uh, you had a slide on heritability. Yeah. And I'm not sure if I read it right, yeah. but I thought I saw that the heritability was greater in women than in men. Yes. I wondered if you could comment on that. Sure, I'm happy to. It was, yeah, so that was we, we, we um, so that's based on data from um, twin studies where we estimate heritability. We compare identical twins and fraternal twins and identical twins share 100% of their genes and fraternal twins are like other siblings share 50% and we compare. Um, and in those twin studies, their heritability, there are, st there are studies of twins, of female twins, um, adolescents, and it's about 70%. And then in male twins, which are basically from the Vietnam era twin registry, so Vietnam era twins, it's about 35%. Um, and we did find some similar things when we looked at the actual genetic data. Um, so, um, but we think now that, we don't know for sure, we think that's an artifact of the types of trauma, the, the people we study and the types of trauma they experience because the women are all civilians essentially and the men in these studies, the genetic studies and the twin studies are all military men. So the, the gender is confounded with sort of civilian military and type of experience. So I can't really say it's actually like a gender or sex effect. Um, and in fact, there's, a, there's data from the, something called the UK Biobank, where they basically, and people may have read about it because there's been a lot of press about it, but they did genetics on 500,000 people, and they have all these other information on them. And when they looked at the heritability in the UK Biobank for men and women, which are more like all civilian, because really all, almost none of them were in the military, it looks more equal. So it's hard to know at this point. So I think we have time for one more question from Facebook and one more for the room, from the room. Uh, the Facebook question is, can you talk about uh, 
let me bring it back up. Oh, is there anything known about people who have a delayed onset of PTSD and their trajectories for recovery? Yes. Um, so yes, there is some known about that. So people can, it's less common, but people can have a delayed onset of PTSD. Um, meaning that what that means is they look, okay, they look okay after a trauma and then maybe months later, suddenly a PTSD. We don't really understand what causes that. There is some evidence that it can cause by, people can seem to be fine after a big trauma, but then something small, smaller seems to trigger that. Um, and, um, and then the evidence is they also, that among those people, some persist, will have the delayed onset and persist, but then some will just also go down again. So they kind of can look like these same trajectories, but just it's, it's delayed. And it's something that we don't, we actually don't understand a lot about. And I think one more question from the floor. Just apropos of that, do you make a distinction between symptom Relie relieving of symptoms and recovery. Oh, that's a good question. How do you define recovery? That is a good question. Um, so when I talk about treatment studies, they really study symptoms. So these, these empirical studies, like where they do randomized clinical trials. Um, but from, I, so that is from the, like the, the, that's my scientist answer will be, we focus on symptoms, relief of symptoms. But in terms of my own experience, that recovery goes well beyond symptom diminishment. And um, in myself, I'm learning about recovery all the time, actually, because I thought, um, you know, after I went to grad school and everything, I actually thought I would have defined myself as recovered, but I actually didn't know I was still carrying a lot of shame from not having spoken about my rape publicly. And then I had this crazy, this weird opportunity that like fate handed to me. And then all of a sudden I felt like a million pounds was lifted. And so I wasn't even aware that I hadn't, that there was still, I still had a ways to go on my recovery. So that's why I personally would make a distinction. But I think as um, in an academic field, we're not great about studying that answer. And with that. All right, well, thank you very much, Kirsten. And thank, thank you to all of you for joining us tonight and to everybody who joined us on Facebook Live as well. Um, if you registered to attend tonight's talk, I would ask you to please fill out the survey that you're going to receive via email. Let us know what you think. Let us know what was good, what was bad, what we could be doing better. Um, we will be making a recording of tonight's talk available on YouTube. Uh, our YouTube channel is Broad Institute. Uh, please subscribe and please share it with your friends. And we hope you'll join us next week for our next Midsummer Night Science talk. We'll be featuring cancer scientist Mimi Bandopadtai. Uh, who will be talking about advances in understanding and treating childhood brain tumors. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you.